Parshas Noah. So let's talk a little bit about what happened and some lessons that we can learn from the Parsha. I, uh, some of the ideas may sound familiar if you've been here in the past, but I think, I think some of them are very appropriate and powerful. So I like, uh, myself, I like learning them again every year because it uh, inspires me, so hopefully we'll all be inspired. So it's interesting, I like saying this every year because I, fi- I find it as an interesting fact that, did you know that almost every culture in the world, every ancient culture, has a flood story in their culture? Which is, it just, right. Or, meaning, yeah, it's the truth, right? He has two options. Uh, I have Professor Moshe Kava of bar University. He counted the number of cultures with a flood story, and he came to 217. Wow. 217 different cultures. And that's whether you have ancient Asian cultures to Native Americans, African cultures, from Greek cultures, from all around the world, they all have uh, some flood story. But not just like a local flood, where the whole world is destroyed, and a lot of these stories have like a hero who was righteous and is saved. Even a few of them have saving animals and an ark, very similar to what it says in the Torah. So really there's two logical explanations, but really only one explanation is logical. Either there's an inherent compulsion in the human mind to create a false story about floods, or it's an actual event that happened, and that's why it's in the human consciousness of all peoples, of humanity. So I think that's just very interesting. Obviously, it's the second one. right? If, if, if um, it makes sense if that this happened to the entire world and that all of humanity descends from Noah and his children, that we should all have the same history because we're all, we're all related like that. So what exactly was going on back then that Hashem decided to destroy the world? So right, Hashem created man in order that man serves Hashem. Man should serve God. We shouldn't live for our selfish desires. We should overcome the Yetzirah. Sahara. That's why He created us. So we know Adam and Eve, they sinned. So humanity went down a level. But what happened was that humanity started corrupting their ways. And it came to a point where Hashem says, I need to destroy the world and start over. So how did, what, what, what were they doing that was so bad exactly? So, the Medrash says, Medrash Rabbah 31.6, they, create, they were worshipping idols, they were murdering people, and they were doing acts of sexual immorality. Also, let me skip something. Ah, they were arrogant, they were interbreeding different species of animals, they were committing bestiality, and they were stealing. That's in the Gemara in Sanhedrin. So, it's also an interesting practice that they had, they would kind of break the law on technicalities. So let's say there was somebody, the example that the Rishalmi gives is that someone wanted to steal a basket of beans. So if you would steal a basket, it was a certain amount, you could take the person to court to demand that they pay you if you caught them. But there's a certain minimum amount that you can take someone to court for. Right? You can't just bring someone to court for a penny. Right. Today also you have the... $2,000. Oh, right. Oh, that, right. That, I mean, they decriminalize it. Something like that. Right. That's very good. Yeah, there are there are right, there there are there are definitely aspects of our culture, unfortunately, that mimic those of, of mimic that of what was going on before the flood, and we are very lucky that Hashem promised that He's not going to destroy the world, like He did that. But what they would do is it, you, it needs to be a pruta. It needs to be worth uh, pruta is about two cents, whatever the two, value of two cents was. But it's a very very small amount. So if someone wanted to steal a thing of beans, they would steal a, a bean, come back later, steal another bean. So that they could get the thing, so that no one could take them to court. So they were very sneaky in the way they were doing their averus, and they did all of these things. Okay, so those are the averus they were doing. Now, and another thing that's important to remember when we read this story in Chumash, any time we read something in the Torah, we have to remember that we always read it in the context of the oral tradition of the oral Torah. That in addition to what Hashem gave us over Torah Shabbat Shabbat, the written Torah, He also gave us an oral Torah which explains the the written Torah. There's a there's a debate on. Um, on YouTube between Richard Dawkins and Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Richard Dawkins is the he wrote the book. I'm not going to say the name of the book. It's a horrible name, but you know he's the probably the most, he's the most famous atheist in the world nowadays. So he had a debate with Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. There's a lot of interesting points going back and forth, but there was one line that Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs I think really nailed at him. He said he said he said Richard, you're an atheist, but you're a Christian atheist. You're not a Jewish atheist. <laughs> so so what did he mean by that? He meant that you're trying to disprove the Bible based on a Christian interpretation because you were born a Christian and that's your interpretation of the Bible. The Christians don't have an oral tradition. So according to the Christians, 
the, all the flood meant in the book of in the story of Noah was just a lot of water. But it, the oral tradition doesn't say that. Meaning Richard Dawkins was coming to disprove the Bible from quote unquote science because it didn't stem with the way that he interpreted the Bible. But when you interpret the Bible from a Jewish perspective, those questions fall away. For example, it says the verse says that all the days of the earth the time of planting, harvest, cold, hot summer, winter, day and night will not cease. That's after the flood. Meaning Hashem, the Medrash says that what Hashem was doing was promising that after the flood, the natural order of the world won't, won't change again. Which means, the Medrash says, that what, during the time of the flood, the natural order of the world changed. So for example, Rav Yochanan says the constellations didn't follow their normal path. I mean, the whole cosmos were ripped apart and they were operating in a totally strange way that we wouldn't recognize today. Uh, uh, Gemara and Sanhedrin says, 108b, that the sun would rise in the west and set in the east. Uh, the water th- themselves, they weren't natural. It wasn't just regular water. The Gemara says that it was a certain boiling water and it was thick water. It compares it to something that's thick. Uh, it says The verse also says, the water strengthened and increased greatly and the ark traversed upon the water. So Rashi says that it means that the waters were strengthening by themselves, that the waters were growing by themselves. This was a supernatural event. Also, so it, it was raining, but it wasn't the only thing happening. right? There was supernatural water. The sun was rising in the west. The different things were changing, the constellations. What? Right. Actually, right. Meaning, a lot of the scientific data they have, let's take carbon dating, for example. Carbon dating is working with the assumption that the rate of carbon, the decay of carbon, hasn't cha- doesn't change and was constant over time. Well, if you're, I guess, a Christian and you're reading the book of Genesis, then you might have a question on things that it says in Genesis. But if you're Jewish and you have the oral tradition, well, wait a minute. My tradition tells me that things weren't natural and things were not operating in the same way that they're operating now. So how can you ask me a question? You're working with an assumption, which a priori, I tell you, we don't hold this true. We don't believe that the world was operating the same way during the flood as it is now. Okay. Also, the Ramban says, or you just read the story, the, the Ramban says the fact that all those animals could fit in the ark and Noah could feed all of them, that was all miraculous. I mean, the whole thing was miracles. Right? We believe in Hashem. We believe in the supernatural. We believe in the spiritual world. This was not just a... Um, physical thing going on here. Also, it says, before the, even before the flood, things were different, not only during the flood. It said, before the flood, people, people only, only need to plant in their farms once every 40 years. You plant, and then you have crops for 40 years. So they could travel from one end of the world to the other in a brief period. They could uproot uh, cedar trees. It says that the climate was different, which is very interesting. The climate was like uh, April the whole year. It's also interesting. Also, it says women would only be pregnant for three days, according to one opinion. Some said they were only pregnant for one day. The idea is that the assumption that the world has always existed as it exists now, and therefore you could extrapolate backwards, according to Judaism, is an incorrect assumption. So any hypothesis you have built on that assumption is therefore incorrect, according to the oral tradition. But so if you're Richard Dawkins and you don't know any of this, because whatever... You weren't brought up that way. You never bothered to study it. You read the literal word of the Bible without any interpretation so you can make that mistake. Okay, so that was just a little about the flood in general. Now I would like to read the Beis HaLevi. If you've ever read the Beis HaLevi, I think they have, I think you can get it in English, but it's primarily in Hebrew. It's a really small safer compared to other farm. The Beis HaLevi was, so there's a, there's a yeshiva now. One of the best yeshivas in the world is called Brisk. So Rav Mishua Soloveitchik is the yeshiva there now. So his grandfather's grandfather was the Beis HaLevi. The Beis HaLevi was the Rashiv and Velazhin, one of the big, 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 big rabbis, and just his, has an explanation on the beginning part of the Torah, when the days were short, because I think when the days were short, he used to give drushes between Mincha and Shabbos. And uh, just very, I like the Savior because it's like very basic ideas and very uh, touching ideas in, in Judaism. So it says, the Pesach says in the beginning of what was going on before the flood, one of the things we mentioned, the verse says, the world was becoming uh, corrupted in front of Hashem, and the world was full of Hamas. 
Ironically, we read that this week. Right. Hamas literally means theft. But. So what does it mean the world was corrupting its... Okay, Hishchitz Kol Basar is dark. Also, it also says that the flesh, that the animals, the creatures, were corrupting their ways on the, on the earth. Amr Rabbi Yechanan, Rabbi Yechanan says, Malamed Shereviu Beheim Al-Chaya, Chayal Beheim Al-Chaya, Adam Adam al what does this teach us? It teaches us that the different animals were interbreeding with each other. So you could have a cat breeding with a porcupine, however that works. I imagine. And that, I don't know. It must listen. There's more porcupines in the world. They must must do it somehow. Must reproduce somehow. Oh, yeah, everything. Oh, this so or that. That they still uh, right. Uh, and also people. People were uh, committing these acts, and I saw on the news recently there's a move now to make that uh, make that more accepted, just like the time of the flood. Anyway, so that's what was going on. So the Gemara asks... Oh, it's fine. So Noah was only supposed to take in the animals that didn't corrupt their ways. Now, the basically of you asked a question. So he understands that human beings, they corrupted their ways because they were committing bestiality. But what's the problem with the animals? A human being has free will. He can choose to do something disgusting. But an animal, an animal doesn't choose to do something disgusting. It just goes with the way that it was created. So what, what is the significance of telling us that the animals were interbreeding? He said it also, he said it can understand maybe it happens once in a while. Animals do that, but they were constantly doing it. So what's the, what's the idea? So with this, he says he is sowed. There's actually, I think, red lions and tigers together. Oh, yeah? Oh, oh ligers. ligers? Yeah. Crazy. So, but what, what's, the, what's this concept, again, that human beings, yeah, you have free will, so you did something wrong, so we'll tell you about that. The Torah will tell you about that. But what about the animals? Who cares what the animals were doing? They don't have free will. So first he says, uh, he says, when a person sins repeatedly and you do something wrong, it becomes part of your nature. So even something which you would think is disgusting and perverted, if you do it enough times, it becomes part of your nature to the point where you need to do it. It becomes something you have to do. And it becomes natural. Not only that, he says, it becomes has, you have a greater desire to do that thing. So you can start out with something to you that's totally disgusting and repulsive. And if you do it enough times, it's going to be something that you really, really desire to do. And then you need it. But the Vesel Levy goes a step further. He says, not only that, <coughs> but... Not only that when you sin, it becomes part of you, when you sin repeatedly, but also it becomes part of the world around you. He says, Hashem created the world in such a way that when a person repeatedly sins, it affects the world and actually corrupts the world himself. So I'm going to read actually some of his words here. He says, when a person sins, it affects the entire world. And he says, not only if a person sins in public, and that influences other people, but he says, even if a person, even if a person sins in private, nevertheless, since he's going after a certain desire he has, it strengthens that desire, where it becomes rooted in all of creation around him. And it becomes that creation itself has a bigger pull towards that desire than it did before. Because Hashem created the world in a such a way that the world is impacted by the actions of mankind, of humankind. So he says, if a person repeatedly does a sin, not only does it affect the person himself, but it spiritually affects the entire environment, that it makes it easier, and it makes it more likely that others will sin in that direction also, spiritually. It corrupts the world. And based on the, cre- the actions of people, that's how the world will change. He says, not only in animals. So he's saying here, why were the animals, why is it significant that the animals were corrupted their ways? He says, because since people corrupted their ways so much, it impacted the world that even the animals were affected that that unnatural desire that the people had 
became spiritually implanted in the world that even the animals were acting out on it. And he says it's not only doesn't only affect the animals. He says it also affects the land. For example, we say that Egypt was an impure land. What does it mean that Egypt was an impure land? That the land of Egypt was so corrupt that the actual land itself became impure, that if you would go into Egypt, it would be easier for you to sin and more likely for you to sin than if, than if you were living somewhere else. And even if you didn't see anybody, just the fact of you being in that land, since the land itself was corrupted by people's actions, it would affect you more negatively. He says, this is not something that you can understand intellectually. But it's something that you could feel with the sensitivity. Uh, uh, when you go to, let's say you go to a certain country that's known for licentiousness, it's something that a spiritual person could feel. So this is not a logical thing. So this is how, it, but this is how Hashem made the world. Hashem made the world, again, Hashem made the world in a way that when a person sins repeatedly, it affects him, that he desires the thing, even if at the beginning, at the beginning it was something which was detestable and disgusting for him, he comes to desire it more. And not only does it affect him, but it affects the animals and it affects the entire space in the physical world where he lives. There's a story with Rav Hanan Wasserman that I heard from someone, I think, who heard who was the driver in the story. Rav Hanan Wasserman was one of the great Roshi Yeshiva in the early half of the 20th century. In the 1930s, he came to the United States to raise funds for his Yeshiva. So in the 1930s, he was being driven through New York City, right, uh, we're all we're all old enough. We remember what Times Square was like before uh, Giuliani. So Rav Hanan Wasserman was being yes, yes, hookers and other things. So Rav Hanan Wasserman, the driver, he was being driven through Times Square, and the driver said his eyes were totally closed, and all of a sudden he goes, "Tuma, Tuma, impurity, impurity, get me out of here, get me out of here, turn around." He said he could sense that there was something impure in the place where he was. That's what the Beis Halevi is saying. The Beis Halevi is saying that the way we act even affects our physical surroundings. So, you know, Rav Hanan, he, he had, it was 1939, I think it was right before 1939, 38, something like that, and they told him, you know, you should really stay in America because of what's going on. And he said, um, I have my yeshiva, I'm the head of the yeshiva, I have to go back. He went back to Europe, and he was murdered by the, I think it was by the Lithuanians after the Nazis invaded Lithuania. But he was... Uh, he was murdered. But he went back for his yeshiva. Went back to his yeshiva. Also the Gemara, the Rebbe Halevi says, this explains the Gemara. It says a tzaddik will get his portion and the portion of his friends, and a Russia will get his portion and the portion of his friends. So he says, how is that fair? Why should I get... Right, I'm a tzaddik, so why should I get your portion? A Russia, why should you get his portion? So he says like this, since a person's actions affect his environment, when the, times, the few times that a tzaddik sins, that could be because the Russia polluted the environment. Meaning, a tzaddik, let's say, if everything else being equal, the tzaddik wouldn't have erred, wouldn't have made a mistake in this situation. But since the Russia has been doing a virus his whole life, the tzaddik wasn't able to overcome the Yetzirah because the Russia made it easier for individuals to sin. So since the Russia caused the tzaddik to sin, the Russia has a portion, a big portion, in the sin of the tzaddik. And vice versa. So when a tzaddik, we do good things, does mitzvahs, he learns Torah, that makes it easier for other people to do mitzvahs and learning Torah. And again, this is even when he's doing privately. Rav Eliashev learning in his house from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. every day when no one could see him, that made it easier for other people in that area to study Torah also. Meaning it weakened the Yetzirah and strengthened the Yetzir Tov and strengthened the spiritual desire. Right? Because everything we choose to do, let's face it, we have urges to do both things. I want to sleep in and not go to Minyan. I want to get up and go to Minyan. I want to study Torah. I want to go home and go to bed. I want to eat this night. Right? We always have competing things. We have a body and we have the Yetzirah. We have the Yetzirah Tov. And sometimes the Yetzirah is stronger. Sometimes the Yetzirah Tov is strong. So how does, it, how does the Yetzirah Tov strengthen? When other people around us are doing good things, that strengthens the Yetzirah Tov. And that helps everybody. It makes it easier for everybody to do mitzvahs. When people are doing Averis, it makes it easier for people to do Averis. Now, he adds a caveat here. He says, that doesn't give you permission if you live in a bad city to just do Averis and blame it on everybody else because Hashem still gives you the power to overcome it. It's just going to be a lot harder. You have a lot more to overcome. Right? So, that's actually why he says the difference between Noah and Abraham. There's a famous Medrash, which hopefully we'll talk about more next week, that it says Noah was 
like stuck in the mud. He was like a friend of the king, and the king says, "Come." He helps him. He helps him out of the mud, and he says, "Come, walk with me." And he, and the king helps him along the way. Whereas Abraham was, he says, he sees someone lighting a, a candle in the window, and he says, "Why are you lighting a candle in here? Walk before me and light the way for me." The idea is this: that Noah was a tzaddik, but he needed the help of Hashem to 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 be a true tzaddik. Whereas Abraham could do it all by himself. So the Beit HaLevi says maybe the reason that Noah needed the help is that really, had Noah lived in a righteous generation, he would have been righteous. But he was not able to overcome the negative influences of his generation without Hashem's help. That's why he had to go into the Teva to be shut off from all of the negative influences. When it, everything else being equal, right? it's like you want to study Torah and you... Go to Bnei Brak and you study Torah. There you could be a tzaddik. Some people, that's good. They, they can do that. They can go to Bnei Brak. They don't have the temptations. And they can study and focus Torah. But as soon as you take that guy out and you put him in, let's say, New York City in Manhattan, with all the temptations, he's not able to do it. Right? Different people. That was Noah. When he was closed off in the table, he could do it. But as soon as he went in the outside world, he wasn't, because they were so uh, impure and they were so evil, he wasn't uh, able to do it. Whereas Abraham, Abraham was able to do it all by himself. Not only was he a tzaddik, but he was able to overcome the evil caused by his generation that it didn't imp- impact him. He didn't even need Hashem's help for that. That's the difference between Noah and Abraham. Also, it says that, the, 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 the Mishnah in Pirkei Yavah says that when a person dies, he's going to have to give a din uh judgment and an accounting. So what's with the two words? Why don't you say it? You have a judgment, period. What's din the chajman? So he says, a din you're going to have to give on what you did, what you did wrong, and what you didn't do. Chajman is on the, your actions caused on others, meaning since I sinned, that made it harder for somebody else to do mitzvahs, and it's easier for them to sin. So I have to give a chajman on the fact that I influence other people in a negative way, or a positive way. And again, this, doesn't, this isn't the logical thing of doing it. We're not talking about a guy who, uh, you know, like drives in the Shalom Shabbos eating a cheeseburger and like playing a stereo, doing everything in the open. That's obvious that you're gonna get a person's gonna get punished for influence others. We're talking about a guy sitting at home, nobody sees him, but we as Jews we believe that the mitzvos and averis that he does affects the world around it and makes it easier or harder for other people to do averis. That's why it's important to live in a place with righteous people. Right? Because it's it's easier to serve Hashem like that. Right? And so, basically, nowadays, I think, I think we all, I don't think there's anything very difficult to live in a teva now, live in an ark like Noah. We're all surrounded and inundated by a secular culture, which I think much of is quite evil. I, I think some of that evil, yeah, I think some of that evil came out in the past two weeks, more than I thought. I have, I have to say, I always took myself as not being a naive person, but the past two weeks I realized I was very naive. I knew people would lie. I know people lie. I know people twist the truth. I just didn't know, I didn't realize to what degree people would lie. You know, you know, Jews, we live, we believe that the purpose of life is to serve Hashem and to learn how to not be selfish. And that what we want isn't the most important thing. And we work on ourselves to overcome the natural selfish desires to serve Hashem. The secular world believes in the opposite. They believe in enhancing the... I'm not saying everybody, I'm saying that I think I'm talking about secular culture. The messages I'm saying that come out of secular culture in general is that you have to, the way to be happy is to indulge yourself in whatever you want, whether it's pursuit of honor, pursuit of money, pursuit of physical pleasures. And the way to do that is to, um, is to do whatever you want and uh, you can use any means necessary to get that. So again, I knew people cheat and steal and this, but the level to which they do that this week and the, the total lack of morality and total lack of concern for truth just to get y- your cause you know I think the problem is we Jews we look at people like ourselves and we think no one would lie to no one would say a hospital is no one would say Israel blew up a hospital and make it up and the hospital didn't even blow up and it was really alright nobody why would, how could someone do that right Where we wouldn't do that but the point that they they believe a certain thing, and that's their agenda, and they will totally make things up to get their agenda. That's society at large. Someone someone tweeted out that, you know, when the whole thing with the babies, the dead babies, and 
oh, they weren't beheaded, they were beheaded. First of all, the fact that you're arguing about that is retarded, that when the babies were beheaded, they were murdered. I have a friend who's, um, he was on, he, he's um, a Hever Kadisha for the IDF, and he was on CNN. He said he held a baby riddled with bullets in his hands. Right? So that, yeah, the world wanted proof for that. The world, we had to bring proof, show proof that this happened, that happened. But when a terrorist organization says the Israeli bombed the hospital and there's 500 dead, then they believe it right away. You just see the double standard. You see the lies and the hypocrisy. And it's not only this, because they want something. This is their agenda. They want the Palestinian cause. They will do everything they want. They have no shred of morality, no shred of a concept of telling the truth and not lying, no shred of the fact that it caused murders. It was a blood libel when they said with the hospital. They burnt down a shul in Tunisia. The Arabs are rioting across the world. And the blame is on also every single media source in the United States and around the world that printed what a terrorist organization said that just murdered and raped people and they totally believe it, the blame is on them for a blood libel. Why? Because they want the ratings, and they're pandering to their base, right? That's the culture that we live in right now. We don't have any choice but to be Avram Avinu. We don't have any choice to realize that it's difficult to be a tzaddik nowadays, because if this is the values of the world that we live in, we have to try extra hard to not only to be a tzaddik in the natural way that we have to overcome our natural desires, but we also have to become a tzaddik because the world is so polluted with this evil in the world. So that makes it all the more difficult. So I got, I don't know, I think a lot of people got a, a rude awakening this week. I definitely myself got a, uh, got a rude awakening. Oh, what was I going to say? Okay, I just want to finish off with a similar idea from the Nefesh Chaim. I'll say it outside. Nefesh Chaim asked a question at the beginning of the Sefer. He says, it says in last week's Parsha that man was created in the image of God. He says, what in the world does that mean? God doesn't have an image. We know one of the one of the 13 principles of faith of Judaism is that God does not have a faith, doesn't have a body, doesn't have an image. If a person believes that, he can't count them in a minion, he can't drink his wine, he can't eat a shechita. He's considered an apikoris, he's considered a heretic. So what does it mean we're creating the image of Hashem? So I'm condensing a lot of things quickly here, but the idea is that Hashem is the source of all power. He's bala kaifas kulam. He, everything, the fact that this table exists is because Hashem wants it to exist right now. So when it means that we were created in the image of God, it means that Hashem gave mankind a power. Which means that based on our actions, that is how Hashem interacts with the world. Hashem adds holiness to the world when we do good things, when we do mitzvahs. Hashem didn't have to make the world like that, but our actions actually impact the spiritual world. That when we do mitzvahs, goodness comes to the world. Evil, things like Hamas are defeated. And when we do bad things, that's when evil can prosper. That's how Hashem made the world. Similar idea to the Beis Levi. The idea I'm trying to say is that we've been going, to, hearing speeches about doing mitzvahs and learning Torah for brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael. It's not just lip service. The Jewish religion firmly believes that when we do mitzvahs, it literally impacts the not only the spiritual world, like Nevesh Chaim saying, but like the Beis Levi saying, is our physical environment. It makes it easier for others to do mitzvahs. And when the Jewish people do mitzvahs, which means what's a mitzvah is we're following the will of Hashem. When we follow the will of Hashem, we do what God wants, then that, that repairs the world. And that's the only way that there will be a salvation for the Jewish people. So uh, let's try our best to, to do that and follow what the Beis Halevi is, uh, is saying.